is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm your host, Mac Pritchard. I'm also the founder of Max List. It's a job board in the Pacific Northwest that helps you find a fulfilling career. Every Wednesday, I talk to a different expert about the tools you need to get the work you want. Find Your Dream Job is brought to you by Top Resume. Top Resume has helped hundreds of thousands of professionals land more interviews and get hired faster. Get a free review of your resume today. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Most employers say workplace diversity is a top priority, but how do you find the companies that actually attract and keep a diverse workforce? Our guest today says it starts with candidates being their authentic selves. Here to talk about this is Marcus Carter. He's a senior recruiter at Instrument. It's a creative agency, engineering firm, and consultancy. Marcus joins us today from Vancouver, Washington. Marcus, uh, let's jump right into it. What are the benefits of working for an employer with a diverse workforce, both uh, in your job and, and your career? Yeah, I think one of the essential points in working in a diverse for- workforce is having a shared sense of experience uh, being able to talk to people who identify with, you know, certain cultural preferences or um, people who understand certain systemic inequities that you might be up against. It's always great when you have, you know, a partner who knows that lived experience. And then as it relates to um, having a boss who is, you know, identifies with your uh, ethnic or racial group, um, I think that is almost a, a load off your shoulders when you feel like you have someone who is, is a mentor, someone who's a sponsor, uh, someone you can connect and identify with without having to pull information out of you, uh, if you will. I want to talk about how to find these companies, but I also want to acknowledge that we're recording this in the summer of 2020. And after the death of George Floyd in Minnesota, we, we saw so many companies put out statements about the importance of diversity, especially in hiring. Um, how, how do you think candidates, Marcus, should pay attention to those statements? Yeah, it's tough because uh, the market is flooded with statements at this current moment. I think one indicator of whether or not that organization is living up to the sort of ethic and ethos that they promote is how many uh, employees, their black employees, uh, brown, indigenous employees, are co-signing and reposting and sharing the messages of their uh, employers. I think it speaks volumes if they are silent about those messagings. Uh, And again, it also speaks volumes if they are amplifying uh, that messaging. Maybe to go a layer deeper, I think there's some some basics we can all sort of check off the box in terms of, you know, does an organization have affinity groups? Are these affinity groups uh, supported by executive sponsors? Um, you know, asking an organization in an interview process, how do they define diversity throughout their talent acquisition uh, funnel? Um, and then just always having inquiry as it relates to mentorship uh, programs, right? How are organizations being intentional about growth and development of specifically their uh, black and brown and indigenous populations? How do you research these things uh, when you're a candidate? Obviously, you can look at social channels to see if employees are, are re- share, sharing those company statements. But the other point you bring up um, – do you learn these things through conversations with people inside the company? Is this information you can find online? What do you recommend, Marcus? Yeah, I mean, for example, if an organization has uh, affinity groups or employee resource groups, they'll typically broadcast that on a career site, if you will. So I think there's an opportunity to dig and identify that information via a career site. Uh, The other piece I think people should invest in is in tech, there's an abundance of social and digital uh, affinity groups, right? There's out in tech, there's blacks in tech, so on and so forth. So you're able to find people who work at these organizations and ask them, hey, you know, what? how do, does your organization define uh, diversity? What are they doing with their uh, uh, affinity groups? What kind of influence and what kind of space do they take up within your organization? And again, the, the, the piece I want to continue to highlight is 
you know, are there specific mentorship programs? How do they go about uh, development uh, at your organization? Could, could you, would you be willing to highlight the career ladder and, and what sort of practical steps could someone take to progress there? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, why are in mentorship programs so important? What difference can they make in a, a person's career, particularly a, a person of color? Yeah, well, I think we open this conversation by talking about the, the impact of working in a diverse workforce. And typically what we've seen in the tech industry is if, you know, let's say Marcus is an African-American whale male joins a, you know, predominantly white organization um, and there's no explicit call out on who is the mentor, right? Who is the person that will help, you know, sponsor and help you get uh, promoted. That sort of defaults to the status quo, right? It's probably going to be uh, a gentleman or, or a, a young woman or, or someone who looks like whoever that influencer might be. Um, and unfortunately, that promotes a very homogenous uh, workforce, promotes a very um, an environment that is uh, managing structural and cultural exclusion, right? And you're putting a lot on one employee to hopefully, um, you know, cr- break the ceiling, if you will. So I think, again, when I'm talking about the importance of mentorship programs, is that organization taking accountability and understanding that different demographics within their workforce have different experiences? How are we being intentional about developing uh, that talent? The companies that you see do these in- mentorship programs and develop this talent well, what are they doing differently? Uh, particularly if they're small organizations that might not have a lot of resources, uh, what what makes them stand out, Marcus? Yeah, I think the 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 main thing I would just highlight is intentionality. Right? Um, should I join your workforce? And I have no idea how to progress via the career ladder, right? Or let's say there's an absence of a career ladder, right? And let's say I don't know who is an executive influencer within the organization. And let's say I'm also not the type of person who does the uh, happy hours, you know, each each week or, or what have you. Um, should that be held against me as it relates to uh, promotions? Um, you know, I would say it should not, right? But if you lack a relationship and don't understand who in the workforce can um, sponsor and speak to you, speak about your ability on your behalf, then I think that does actually impact your career trajectory between, you know, one company and another, if you will. So I, again, I think most companies, I think it's being very intentional and in making sure people don't uh, fall through the cracks, if you will. It's no different from the declaration around diversity recruitment, right? I think that um, genre, if you will, grows and has continued to grow because people realize they've neglected to actually diversify their funnel. And the companies that do diversify their funnels, why does that happen and how do they do it? What, 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 uh, because I'm sure there are many companies that are well-intentioned and they fail, but the ones who succeed, what, what are they doing differently, Marcus? Yeah, I would say the ones who, who might do it well uh, lean on the relationship they can build with the different demographics, right? And when I say relationship, I'm not talking about just showing up uh, for the job there. Right. I mean, actually building holistic relationships that understand, hey, candidates have different 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 needs, if you will. And they uh, demonstrate uh, uh, an ability to center equity in the relationship. And I think that's very important. For example, in the tech industry, we often like to say, how can we get underrepresented groups a seat at the table with us? And I would say there's 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 definitely an absence of an equitable lens when you use that perspective. Another point of view would be to say, how can tech get a seat at the table with them? Right. Whether that's, you know, underrepresented groups uh, via high school, uh, underrepresented groups via you know college. And obviously the current pool of talent that exists out there uh, right now as as professionals. So, again, what, what's a way we can get a seat at the table with them versus feeling like people have to come to you? We talked at the start of the interview about ways candidates uh, can find these employers that are, are doing di- things differently. You mentioned um, having conversations with 
uh, current employees, uh, turning to networking groups and relationships, and looking at the company's actual record, particularly in creating mentorship programs. Are are there other steps you recommend a candidate take uh, when trying to identify companies that are going to allow them, uh, that are going to reward them for being their authentic selves? Yeah, I think, you know, there's always the practical step of um, being able to identify themes and trends via feedback from Glassdoor, right? That's very practical. People are typically fairly honest on that. The other um, area I would ask people to invest in is Slack channels, right? A lot of times, um, I'm in probably too many Slack channels at this point, but there's phenomenal, you know, networking, whether that's, you know, job hunting or just resource sharing happening via Slack channels. I feel like, especially as COVID-19 hit, I got a ton of insight from Slack channels that were global as well as national and understanding how other people are managing their job search or, for example, how recruiters are going about attracting candidates. It gave me, again, a national and global scope versus just limiting my perspective to here in Portland. What do you think is the biggest challenge for a candidate who's trying to identify the, the, the employers that do have diverse uh, workforces and 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 keep those employees. What what stops uh, candidates from finding those companies? Yeah, you know, part of it is the language organizations use. Right, the the language can uh, sort of flatten experiences by highlighting, hey, you know, we're looking for diverse candidates. Well, what exactly is a diverse candidate? Right. How is the organization being explicit? So are they uh, thinking about diversity strictly through the lens of race and gender? Right. Are they just thinking of uh, diversity of thought? Right. So, again, finding organizations who can be very explicit about who they identify as diverse. And I'm I'm pretty sure they probably have a very sharp funnel in how they built that relationship uh, with those different audiences. So that that is extremely important. Again, the the intentionality and being explicit about uh, who an organization is uh, uh, trying to attract. Any other barriers come to mind? Yeah, you know, uh, some of the barriers is just uh, blatant uh, tokenization, right? An organization that on their website, on their career site, they have, you know, stock photos of, you know, communities of, of color, right? And those stock photos don't even show people um, engaging outside of the workforce, right? It's just people typically, uh, you know, in the hallways or, or, you know, maybe they are dressed in a sh- shirt and tie uh, via uh, conference rooms, right? So I think that's one way to turn people away, right? And, and you know, organizations who have written um, job uh, postings that typically conform to a very uh, white-centered, homogenous sort of identity intact. And then at the very end, they'll throw in an EEO statement, right? They'll highlight like, hey, we are looking for recruitment, but the ad lean more towards, you know, your super ninja developer, if you will, right? The ad was in its totality exclusive, right? But they tried to add the diversity language at the end. So I think those are some markers that typically turn uh, candidates uh, away. Well, I want to take a break, Marcus. When we come back, I want to continue our conversation about how to be your authentic self in a job search. I particularly want to draw you out about your advice about how to ask these kinds of questions in interviews. And I also want to talk about the different experiences that uh, different communities have in a job search. So stay with us. There is no one else like you, but when it's time to write your resume, You may rely on a template used by thousands of others, and you can end up with a resume that makes you look like everybody else. Instead, wouldn't you like to have a resume that tells your own story? Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Top resume has expert writers who can work with you to craft a resume to land the job you want. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. With top resume's help, you can write a -a one-of-a-kind resume that stands out in a tall stack of applications. The experts at Top Resume understand how employers hire. So your resume will also include the key words and format you need to get past the dreaded applicant tracking systems. Find out for yourself. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Now, let's get back to the show.
We're back in the Maxlist studio. I'm talking with Marcus Carter. He's a senior recruiter at Instrument. It's a creative agency, engineering firm, and consultancy. Now, Marcus, before the break, we were talking about how to be your authentic self in your job search. I, I do want to talk about, uh, before we dig into that a little more, about the different experiences that uh, uh, communities of color have in the job search. Uh, and I, I remember when we had a, a, a pre-interview, you talked about research that shows um, that applicants um, from black communities, for example, get a very different response when their resumes are sent in uh, versus people who have a, a different kind of names. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, so there's been uh, tons and tons of research that shows, you know, someone use their native name and it, um, for whatever reason, is hard to pronounce in English, um, their probability of them actually getting an interview request is much lower than someone who has the name John Smith, right? We've actually seen, there's been studies that have um, highlighted this if we're talking about gender, right? There's women who have just decided to use their initials, and that's been a way for them to get forward in the interview process. Uh, and then again, as it relates to race, you've had people who have uh, changed you know, their name to sound closer to what you might consider white identifying, and they've had greater success. Uh, in our pre-call, I highlighted a Harvard sociologist, uh, Diva Page, who unfortunately passed away in 2018. Uh, but Diva Page did a phenomenal job documenting racial discrimination as it relates to uh, the labor market. And, it, you know, Diva first got started in a, in a dissertation uh, that was extremely successful. That was in 2003, and then wrote a book called Marked, which was uh, published in uh, 20, uh, actually 2007. Uh, but again, it highlights the inequities around race and the job market. And, and since then, I think, you know, that research has uh, exploded. So what advice do you have for candidates uh, about how to be their authentic self while not jeopardizing their chances to get the job they want? Uh, what do you see work? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to being your authentic self, you have to know what you want. That's part of it, right? Know, know your, your intention, know what kind of trajectory you want, uh, and then also gain a sense of like, what kind of obstacles might you face, right? Because I don't care whether you're, you're black, white, brown, whatever, everyone's going to face some sort of obstacle, right? Now, it might not be related to race, right? It could be, you know, growing a specific competency, but understand what is your tolerance and sort of threshold in the workforce, and I think that is essential because a lot of people go in and they might believe in this concept of a meritocracy and, hey, if you just work hard, you'll get ahead. And then you look around, you know, five, six, six, five, six, seven years later and realize maybe you haven't progressed at that rate or your peers and those who came in at the same time as you have. Right. So, again, I think people have to know exactly what they want and try to have uh, some sort of gauge of what what is their tolerance. And now don't get me wrong. I don't think that is acceptable. People should not have to have that experience, but I also want to be fair and say that does happen. So people do have to gauge, again, what is my tolerance? And again, what kind of intel can I pull out of an employer via the interview process as well as their uh, networking? So how do you do that, Marcus? How, how do you pull to get, together that information so that you can make those decisions? And when you talk about tolerance, Tell us more about that. What does that mean? Yeah, so let's talk about maybe the interview process. Um, one red flag for me is if the employer does not ask any explicit questions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? If I note that they have a statement on their website or they have a statement uh, via their job post, yet we get in the interview process, and whether that's interview one, two, three, seven, or eight, and there's not been one question around diversity. I would question how authentic, what kind of intensity, what kind of internal discussions are even existing around diversity, equity, and inclusion in order for them to omit highlighting that uh, in the interview process. The other piece is when an organization cannot produce a diverse interview panel, 
right? That tells you a lot in in and of itself, just in terms of, you know, uh, visual and physical makeup of the team and representation. Um, the other piece is I, I think in the interview process, it is very fair to ask them, um, what what might they share uh, as it relates to their diversity, equity, and inclusion programming, right? Um, you might inquire about what kind of holidays do they uh, observe, right? We have Juneteenth, uh, which is a holiday uh, observing, you know, essentially the, the emancipation of African Americans here uh, in the U.S. Uh, that's going to be this uh, Friday, right? I think if an organization observes something like that, at least for the African-American community, you would hope there's been a significant amount of dialogue and understanding and education within that organization to observe that. Um, where I currently work at Instrument, we've had uh, Indigenous Peoples Day off, right? That is that is still a newer term to others, but that shows me like, look, the organization has been doing its work to understand sort of a, a global perspective, if you will, versus adopting just a, a Western or sort of homogenous perspective on what is a quote unquote, you know, federal or observed uh, holiday. What questions do you recommend employers either ask about diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in an interview process? Um, because I, w- there are many candidates who are listening who probably have never gotten a question about that. What what would be a, a good practice? Uh, you know, I think there's a number of questions. I, I would, instead of, uh, you know, immediately off the top of my head saying, hey, it's one question or the another. Um, when people type in diversity, equity, and inclusion questions, the best resources I have found actually come from academia and higher education. Uh, they do that very well in terms of you can find, you know, two, three pages worth of questions that they ask faculty or staff specifically related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, yeah, I mean, you could type in, I don't know, University of Michigan diversity, equity, and inclusion questions. And I'm sure you're going to have a page full of questions that they ask candidates to inquire about, hey, what is their sensitivity and understanding? What kind of uh, uh, racial and gender equity and analysis are they bringing as they engage with that institution? Candidates who are doing a search that... uh allows them to be in a, to, to find employers that uh, are going to reward them for being their authentic selves. What else are they doing differently? I mean, you asked, uh, gave us examples of questions you might ask in, in, in an interview at, uh, or that you should ask rather. Um, and earlier before the break, we talked about some of the research and networking that people could do. What else should people consider as they do their search? Yeah, again, I think uh, the, the, the main thing I'd like to center is people have to gain an analysis of their own tolerance and, and, and what's the trajectory of their career. Uh, and I say this because Marcus, you know, being, you know, having a decade plus of work experience, my tolerance is fairly high at this point in terms of um, what are certain systems I'm willing to engage with that I feel I'll have an opportunity to help evolve. Whereas when I first joined an organization, however long ago, I probably was completely blind to the inequities in the organization, right? And I, I'm sure the moment the first you know inequity was pointed out to me, I'm sure I threw the biggest fit in the world. Right. I'm sure I thought, you know, the worst of this employer. Had I stuck with it longer, who knows what could have happened. So, again, people have to understand, hey, what are you trying to get to? Right. And do you have an opportunity to work with these different uh, social or digital affinity groups? Talk to people who are um, older in their uh, career, if you will, have more experience. And can they pass on any gems around? you know, what to expect and what are barriers you can get over as well as, Hey, there, there's some things you're just not going to be able to overcome. Uh, so again, I, I, I'd hate to put the onus on um, a projection of, of, of what people think they should get and should not get. And I want to be mindful that that is a determination that a candidate has to make. We've talked about company policies and practices like mentorship programs, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, programs and and practices. Are there other company policies that candidates should ask about in the interview process or consider in their research uh, when they're looking for employers? 
I think transparency is always uh, extremely high, right? And that's transparency around salaries, transparency around obviously policies, transparency around decision making, transparency around you know promotions, career ladders. I think that is that is huge. A candidate shouldn't necessarily have to um, dig for that, right? You'd, you'd hope that a, a recruiter is able to offer that information proactively. And again, in the event that the candidate does dig for that information, that those questions can be answered and that they are uh, valid and not necessarily uh, vague. So uh, again, I would say transparency is, is, is huge. And like I said, a lot of us have an understanding via you know, glass door reviews, right? Or, or maybe you've seen, you know, what people are posting on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Um, you know, for those of us who come from, you know, BIPOC organizations, go follow uh, uh, a company's Twitter handle, right? When, you know, MLK hits or other, you know, uh, what do you call it? Holidays that are specific to your ethnic and cultural background. Does that organization actually tweet about that? How do they celebrate that? Right. I have been very critical of organizations that only present a white identity. Right. So they might observe the typical holidays and they omit things like Black History Month. They omit things like MLK Day. Yet when St. Patrick's Day hits, they're quick to post something about St. Patrick's Day. So, again, I think that's an easy way for people to start to gain an analysis of whether or not this organization is um, inclusive, or at least thinking of ways to attract different demographics. Any other warning signs, Marcus, that a candidate should keep in mind uh, when doing that research or going through a hiring process that might signal an employer might not allow you to be your authentic self? Um, I don't, you know, and, and I still think that re- regardless of the different pointers I've offered, everyone has intuition. And I think when we, we, we listen to ourselves, typically our intuition will not steer us wrong, right? So, you know, first and foremost, listen to your intuition throughout that uh, process. And I think that will give you an answer. Well, it's been a terrific conversation. Now tell us, Marcus, what's next for you? Yeah, for me, well, I am extremely excited that uh, this year I take on a board president uh, opportunity with uh, Portland Workforce Alliance. So I'm extremely excited about that. Um, The last thing I'll note is that I became a board member with the great folks over at Free Geek. That was in March, just as COVID started to pick up. uh, And I did not announce that. But yes, I'm very excited and have loved working with uh, Free Geek and being a part of that organization since. Well, congratulations. Those are both great organizations. I know people can learn more about you and your work in the community and your work at Instrument by connecting with you on LinkedIn and and that you're at Marcus A. Carter number two. So, Marcus, given all the useful tips you've shared today, what's the one thing you want a uh, listener to remember about how to be your authentic self in a job search? And, and, you know, number one is, is know what you want and just don't compromise. Do you worry about your resume? Get it reviewed for free by Top Resume. Find out what the experts think. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. And if you like this show... Sign up for our free podcast newsletter. Every Wednesday, you'll get all the resources mentioned in that week's show and a transcript of the interview, too. Go to maxlist.org slash show notes. Again, that's maxlist.org slash show notes. Next week, our guest will be Anna Loka Kova. Anna is a career advisor, speaker, and LinkedIn trainer. She helps people tell their professional story online on paper, and in person. Kudos to you if you've updated your LinkedIn page recently, but LinkedIn is also a great tool for networking with others. Anna and I will talk about five ways you can network on LinkedIn like a pro. I hope you'll join us. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.